Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, very uh, uh, much to our seminar, the PAO webinar on the design and analysis of the first national food consumption service in, in St. Kitts and Nevis in 2020. And I would like to, to welcome everybody who is uh, in this webinar. We have uh, more than four, uh, we have more than 100 people registered and uh, we have a very many very interesting presentations in front of us. So I would like to, uh, to uh, say that um, the first one will be Renata Klake to uh, do the welcome and introduction. Then uh, Dolores uh, Stapelen Harris will do a welcome. Then Sharon Hutchinson uh, will do an overview of the survey and the role of the collaborators. Uh, Dr. Bauer will uh, talk about the opportunities and challenges in the preparation of the MyFood24 data collection and software. Uh, I myself, Ruth Sharon Dier, will speak about the Caribbean um, photo book with household measures, portion photos and standard portions. Latoya Matthew Dukan and uh, Katrin Kagilvana will talk about the experience and lessons learned from the data collection, design, and implementation. Sandra Grisman about the preliminary results and methodological issues in analyzing the survey data. Before Bridget will um, uh, conclude uh, to say what is PAO's commitment to dietary data uh, and dissemination. And thereafter, we will have. Uh, a session of uh, question and answers. So please, uh, Renata, you have the floor. Thank you, Ruth. I'm really happy to be here this morning, not only to welcome you, but to join you. I really want to hear what you Sorry about that. It's been a long and difficult road, a lot of hard work by many people to bring us here. You know, food security and nutrition and promoting healthy diets has always been an important part of FAO's program in the Caribbean. But we haven't really seen the sort of impact that we would have hoped for over the years. And when I say that we would have hoped for, or that countries themselves would have hoped for. And where it's very worrisome looking at the trends in female obesity and also childhood obesity in particular in the Caribbean over the years. So, you know, we all like to quote Einstein. So here I am, you know, Einstein says that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So we really did want a different result. So we figured we have to do something different. And we really worked hard to find funding to do this, uh, this study to see if we can bring better data, if we bring better data into the process, better information, will we end up with better policies and, uh, and more power in our advocacy? So uh, here we are. Maybe one lesson is, or I should say, there's a heavy weight on the shoulders of St. Kitts and Nevis because we worked so hard to get these resources. We need to demonstrate that it was worth it. And maybe getting the next resources to continue this work will be less difficult. So there's a big focus on what happens next. What does St. Kitts and Nevis do with the data to demonstrate that this is an important part to the development of good policies and, and strong programs and the ability to monitor impact. You know, we all get so accustomed to doing things without bothering to, to, to analyze whether it's worked and this needs to change. So um, I did say it was a long and difficult path and the difficulty, as we all know, was very much linked to COVID the team had to keep reinventing ways of doing things just to get to move forward and I really would like once again to recognize the hard work of everyone who was on the, who was part of this team because there was challenge after challenge to overcome while at the same time of course as with all funding sources 
we can't say, okay, we'll wait a while. No, if we didn't meet our deadlines, the money would have vanished and the opportunity would have been lost. So I have said that I, I do know that this is the work of many, but I do want to single out two people who were there from the start. I'm sure that there will be plenty of opportunity for, to, to recognize everyone else. And, and the first person I, I would like to recognize is Ruth Charondier. She's really been the mother of this process from the beginning. She, she has monitored, she has prodded, she has pushed, she has congratulated, she has supported, and when necessary, she has chastised. She's done whatever was needed to keep this going forward in a way that was acceptable to her, according to the standards that FAO has established for this process. The second person that I'd like to, to recognize is Latoya. You know, I met Latoya in St. Kitts and Nevis on my very first mission. I should say my first and only mission because COVID came. I have not been back to St. Kitts and Nevis. And it was her energy that convinced me that we had a strong national counterpart and that, you know, this is always critical in work in the field, that when hard times hit, there's somebody there that's going to help you find solutions. So many other people have joined the team. The UE team has been incredible. Uh, I know Ruth has brought many other partners into the process. We've worked very closely with the headquarters team and everyone has worked hard with that. I look forward to listening to you and understanding what has happened and understanding what's next. So welcome, and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Renata, for your very nice words and uh, introduction. And it's true, it has been really, it was a difficult and but nice journey together. Um, may I give the floor to uh, Dr. Harris? Uh, the uh, PS from St. Kitts and Nevis. Good morning to all. Good morning. Is everybody hearing her clearly? Perfectly clear. Okay. Uh, perfect then. A perfect way to start and to welcome all of you very warmly to this very important webinar, seminar, um, however, whatever we want to call it. The important thing is that it is the dissemination of the findings of a very important survey. I want to thank all of you for coming. I also want, on behalf of the Ministry of Health, to thank all of you who have been involved in the survey and the project from the conceptualization of it, to the participation and to the facilitation. I want to particularly um, recognize Dr. Clark, um, Dr. Hutchinson, Dr. Sharon Deer, and our local person on the ground, Latoya Matthew Duncan, who I concur with you, Dr. Clark has, is very energetic and she knows what she wants. And when she is assigned the project, she knows and goes about it in a very firm and convincing manner. So I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all the other stakeholders who are um, engaging in the meeting. And I want to say also that I am very excited about this morning's engagement because I am informed that the findings of the individual food consumption survey and analysis which was done in St. Kitts and Nevis will be revealed. And it is very interesting because this survey, of course, we recognize was done in a very challenging time in the throes of the coronavirus pandemic. But we are a resilient people and the pandemic has taught us much. And so I am pleased that we were able to complete the project 
within the deadline and that the resources were well utilized. The survey was of immense significance to St. Kitts and Nevis because currently within the Federation, there is a high number of persons with non-communicable diseases. Our NCDs has become a scourge and approximately 83% of our population's death and morbidity would be from non-communicable diseases. Therefore, I find uh, that the findings will provide the critical evidence to augment the Federation's effort to mitigate against the incidence of non-communicable diseases and accelerate our progress toward our target goals, which include relevant food and national programs and policies. Having recognized that poor and unhealthy diet are causing micronutrient deficiencies, malnutrition on both sides, too much and too little. Moreover, our society is reeling from an unfolding obesity epidemic, a key contributing factor of the associated non-communicable diseases. Thus, the Ministry of Health is grateful for the survey as one of its strategic priorities to assist the Federation in tracking its progress. Because despite the critical importance of healthy diets to our health and well being, we are challenged in getting reliable data on what our citizens and residents are eating at the individual level. I therefore wish to take this opportunity to commend the Food and Agriculture Organization for this initiative and to thank the University of the West Indies for its collaborative support and to thank all the pushers and the shakers of the survey that propelled the survey to completion. Once again, I look forward to the outcomes, the findings and the outcomes of the survey that of course would assist us in policy and program formulation. Thank you all, and I wish the session um, very good outcomes. Thank you, it's my pleasure to be part of this opening session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harris, who is the PS uh, in St. Kitts and Nevis. May I give the floor to Sharon to um, give the overview of the survey? Thank you, Ruth. And hello to all the participants. I am the uh, Sharon Hutchinson, the responsible officer for the University of the West Indies. And I am presenting on behalf of Dr. Isabella Granison, the Principal Investigator and the wider team at the University, as well as at the University of Paranya, the Ministry of Health, it's in Kids and Nevis, and FAO. The PS just alluded to the major rise in non-communicable diseases in the Caribbean, which includes things like diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, and specifically the high incidences of obesity and overweight, particularly among women in the Caribbean. So based on this background, the survey is trying to determine food consumption patterns for persons between 18 and 65 years old who reside in St. Kitts and Nevis and collect empirical data that can be used to develop very, uh, very good nutrition policies and programs for this country and we hope by extension the wider Caribbean. In addition, this survey is, is aimed at increasing capacity at the University of the West Indies and also at the Ministry of Health in St. Kitts and Nevis as we all learn how to conduct these kinds of national level surveys. Specifically, uh, the food consumption survey would like to collect data on the amount of food and nutrient intake for the population 
the different food groups that are being used, especially as it relates to the gender divide and across the two islands. It will also be getting information on the energy intake of the population, the nutrient intake, and the percentage of the population that meets the dietary recommendations of the Caribbean. We are also interested in looking at the use of imported versus locally produced food. As you are aware, St. Kitts and Nevis is in the, one of the small windward islands in the Caribbean, just located here in the Caribbean Sea, with a population of just over 50,000 persons. Nevis, which is the smaller island, has about 23% of the population. And so we really wanted to know if food consumption was varying geographically. Now, there were a number of steps that were taken to get the survey implemented. And first, we started with developing the 24-hour recall questionnaire, along with a Google form that contains socioeconomic data that we wanted to collect. We obtained ethics approval from the University of the West Indies, as well as from St. Kitts and Nevis. And then we interviewed various software vendors to determine which software would be most suitable for the survey. Once this was done, we had to engage with the software uh, company to get our training for our staff in terms of how to use the software, how to input the data, etc. At the same time, we had to prepare recipes in order to determine food quantification and determine various estimates such as yield factors. And all, while all this is going on, we had to develop our sampling procedure and also develop manuals for work by the field supervisors and the data collectors on the ground. Many different things were happening at the same time. So even while the sampling procedure was being developed, we had to at the same time develop food and recipe lists, which required us to get staff um, and support personnel from the Ministry of Health to actually go into the supermarkets to get some brand names for foods as it was possible. And this led to the development of a comprehensive food database that included various uh, factors such as preparation methods and household measures that are used. We also sought to develop a photo book from scratch, and this will be dealt with later on in the webinar, where we had to take pictures of the foods, established portion sizes and household measures. We also engage independent consultants to create a compilation of nutrient values for the Caribbean. And while this was not necessary in implementing the survey, this is critical in doing the data analysis. Once the food database was created, it was uploaded to the Micro24 software, which I also show a picture of here. And then this 24 recall was linked to our Google form where we are collecting our socioeconomic data. We had to test the software and then use it in training our field staff via a pilot survey initially, and then the full rollout of the survey. Now there are several variables that we wish to collect, uh, which included several socioeconomic uh, data, such as gender, age, marital status, ethnicity, et cetera. We also wanted to get an uh, estimate of uh, smoking status in the population and the level of physical activity. We asked persons about where they purchase food, whether uh, out, um, and if so, at restaurants, et cetera. We asked persons to self-report height and weight so that we could calculate their BMI. We asked about supplement take uh, on a daily basis, as well as what they ate when they ate a particular meal or snack and where it was eaten, whether at home or at a restaurant, etc. We collected data for 16 food groups, including foods for particular nutritional uses and composite data, dishes, as well as several uh, macronutrients and vitamins and minerals, of which I just sample are given here. And uh, later on in the webinar, the whole complete list will be provided. We work very closely with the Central Statistical Organization in St. Kitts and Nevis to get a list of the number of households and the gender distribution sorted by their 260 enumeration districts. 
That was our sampling frame. And from there, we did a sample run, a simple random sample of 156 of these 260 enumeration districts. From there, we selected a geographic reference point from which households were randomly collected. Once all eligible persons in each household was identified, we used a KISH method to determine which person in the household would participate in the survey. We conducted face-to-face -face interviews only, and the sampling was done every day of the week. In all, 960 persons were sampled. We got the first recall from all 960, and then uh, we planned to have a second recall for half of that sample size. The survey required a lot of resources. Uh, we had 13 tablets uh, that had to be Wi-Fi enabled. There was significant logistics management in terms of getting all the field supervisors and data collectors on the ground in the plan that we had pre uh, prepared because we had to ensure that the sampling was taking place at a particular rate in order to meet our deadlines. We relied heavily on the country coordinator, uh, Mrs. Latoya Masi Dahan, and she coordinated the work on the ground for 20 data collectors and six field supervisors. When data was collected, we had research assistants review the data on a daily basis to give feedback for any gaps that were there or any information that needed to be clarified. All of this was working within a constant quality control by the advisory team and periodic retraining of the field staff. The team uh, was again a huge collaboration here with the University of West Indies as the service provider and linking with the Ministry of Health in St. Kitts and Nevis, together with our international consultant, Dr. Chris Bring, who also liaised with researchers at Federal University of Peronia to provide research support, as well as the FAO advisory team led by Dr. Charandier. And now we have on board Dr. Holmes to work through the various roles because we had to coordinate amongst um, the, all the technical staff. We had several research assistants uh, on working on each of the various components. We had to monitor the data entry and provide feedback to lead to quality control. We also were engaged in data cleaning, analysis, budgeting, and reporting. So I'm just giving you here the tip of the iceberg just to for you to recognize that this was a huge team of support staff as well needed. This endeavor spanned two LOAs with a budget of approximately 300,000 US dollars. And the main steps, each of the main steps took very a uh, lot of time. So the epic approval alone took about five months. Most of the time was spent with developing the food list and the recipe list and the database for upload. The planning uh, uh, for the survey and training and so took about three months, and then the implementation alone took about three months. And now we end this uh, the data analysis. We're wrapping this up now to get into the validation stage. So at this point, it was a huge effort, and I would certainly like to thank all persons who participated. The work, as I said, is funded by the FAO under these two LOAs, and I particularly would like to thank Mrs. Latoya Marty Duncan again, the country coordinator. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is an overview of our work. Thank you, Sharon, for this uh, wonderful introduction of the survey, uh, which helps to understand the rest. May I give the floor to Dr. Bauer? Dr. Bauer, you are still on mute. Thank you so much, uh, Ruth. And uh, I would like to thank all for coming and for me to share my presentation with you entitled Opportunities and Challenges in the Preparation of My Full 24 Data Collection Software. And of course, this presentation is uh, made on behalf of uh, 
uh, this the staff of FAO who, who are involved in this work as well as uh, uh, the staff from the University of Parana, Brazil, and of course the University of the West Indies. Now, why did we choose? Uh, um, Dr. Bauer, would you yeah, mind sharing your screen? Okay, let me see. Yeah. Can you now see it? Hello, can you see the screen now? Hello? Yes, now we can okay. see the screen. All right, all right. All right, so once again, uh, uh, thank all the participants for, for coming uh, to this webinar. And I'm glad to share with you uh, my presentation uh, entitled Opportunities and Challenges in the Preparation of My Food uh, 24 Data Collection uh, Software. So why did we uh, uh, choose uh, this dietary assessment 24 hour record? Uh, as you are all aware, the uh, dietary assessment methods uh, chosen for inclusion of the individual food consumption survey is the multi-pass 24-hour recall. Multi-pass in the sense that uh, step by steps it enables the participants to vividly uh, remember what he or she had ate and, uh, and drank uh, the previous uh, day. And the 24-hour recall has been recognized as one of the best methodologies for monitoring dietary uh, intakes of individuals and um, populations as compared to a food frequency uh, questionnaire. And uh, the use of uh, online software has uh, uh, become more and more uh, popular and is uh, replacing the so-called uh, paper-based 24-hour dietary record, which uh, you all know has many drawbacks because sometimes you cannot even uh, uh, read what has been written. And, and sometimes even, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the figures uh, cannot uh, totally be seen. Therefore, uh, we decided to, to choose the software uh, My Food uh, uh, 24. And what are some of the reasons why we chose this type of software? Well, originally, this software was uh, developed to be used uh, among uh, UK populations in adolescents and, and adults. And then, uh, of course, later, uh, some countries decided to use it and uh, they tailored it to uh, their database. Uh, I, it comes with the UK uh, uh, database. So uh, any country buying this software either has to create uh, its own uh, database or has to tailor it uh, in order to, to use it. So once again, is the ability to create new version of the Caribbean food pattern that made, made us uh, choose this. Uh, this allows the multi multiple past 24 hour record as I mentioned uh, earlier and includes the breakdown of recipes during interview with partial use of yield factors and allows detailed food description, detailed uh, different portion size options and, uh, and uh, images. And of course, these images are to, uh, to enable uh, the participant uh, to clearly state uh, the portion of the food he or she uh, has consumed. And uh, export of results on food and nutrient intake uh, level per subject, uh, broken down by eating uh, Occasion, so it could be uh, could be breakfast, lunch, uh, dinner, uh, and and so on. So, uh, developing uh, my food uh, 20, uh, uh, 24 for use in Saint Kitts and and, and Nevis, uh, it involved uh, many uh, steps. But the major two steps are creating a country-specific detailed uh, food list for Saint Kitts and Nevis as well as St. Vincent and the Grenadines and uh, other parts of uh, uh, the Caribbean uh, region. So about 30,000 food items uh, were included 
uh, in uh, this uh, uh, database, uh, which is uh, uh, following the logic of uh, global diet, uh, an old software for uh, dietary assessment. And of course, a detailed description and allowing always to choose unknown, uh, because sometimes uh, you you ask uh, individuals what they uh, exactly consumed, uh, despite the fact that you show them different options, they still they still don't remember exactly uh, what uh, what the kind of food was or how the preparation was. Therefore, we had this version of uh, unknown. And the completion of all additional files, uh, quantification, food composition, and linking uh, probing uh, foods and of course uh, food groups. So uh, five uh, interlinked tables were uh, prepared. So uh, the food table where information such as uh, food names, brands, and nutrient values were inputted. And of course, uh, food uh, accompaniments. So these items uh, popped up whenever a participant selected a certain entry uh, in the diary. Uh, for example, if they select uh, uh, bread, then uh, butter, margarine could pop up or, or jam, it means uh, things that are usually consumed uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the bread. So, uh, once again, the, the, the food accompaniments, as I earlier mentioned, then the portion uh, sizes, uh, individual entries uh, were made, uh, for example, ready to eat uh, meals, uh, or some, uh, some can share entries if they have the same portion uh, sizes. For example, there were multiple types of honey, uh, all with uh, five grams of teaspoon portion size. And uh, portion groups, this is uh, to help uh, for, for the identification of at least one portion for a product and groups of multiple portions uh, together. For example, a teaspoon, a tablespoon, half a cup, a cup, and, and so on. So uh, it was really uh, extensive. So the food list uh, uh, file incorporated a comprehensive and extensive food description uh, system, as you can see here, uh, food sauce, cow, goat, chicken, and so on, a preparation method, fried, baked, cooked, and so on, and the physical uh, status, so liquid, uh, powder, and other forms. Uh, the color of fruits and vegetables, which is uh, very important, as you are all aware, uh, the color indicates uh, different phytonutrients that help uh, that help in fighting non-communicable disorders. And type of production, homemade or commercial, and type of added uh, fat, butter, uh, vegetable oil, uh, spray, and and so on. Uh, type of uh, added liquid. And synonyms, for example, regional uh, variations, which of course, you know, in the Caribbean, sometimes uh, one food called in, in Trinidad, it could be uh, entirely, would, would have an entirely different name in, uh, in Jamaica. Uh, for example, if you talk about Kalalu, Kalalu in Trinidad is uh, a kind of mixture of uh, vegetables cooked and mashed up together. Uh, with all the killed vitamins, unfortunately. And uh, of course, uh, in Jamaica, if you say Kalalu, uh, they mean the African spinach. So we took all this into consideration. And uh, of course, uh, brand names. Uh, the food quantification file uh, included the following options, household uh, uh, measurements, right? So the cup, uh, the teaspoon, the table, tablespoons, and what, what a, a really what is really a, a heaped tablespoon what is a level tablespoon uh, we were really very precise in uh, the identification of uh, these uh, quantifications and uh, of course uh, the result of uh, what we've done development of the caribbean database this i mean that my food now my food 24 is now fully tailored for use uh, in the caribbean 
uh, underpinned by an appropriate database to reflect uh, intakes in the area of uh, more than 30,000 generic and branded foods. And uh, that includes uh, local dishes and, 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 and recipes. So, and you can see uh, these are the food groups, 16 food groups as uh, Dr. Hutchison had in her presentation that uh, we used. So uh, you can see the number uh, quite, quite extensive, quite a large uh, number of them, as well as the number of the uh, quantifications, really very huge. So you could see that it was really challenging uh, to do this, uh, this work. And uh, recipe data collection and calculation of uh, nutrient composition. So uh, frequently uh, consumed mixed dishes were collected from St. Kitts and, 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 and uh, Nevis, as well as uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Recipe information were collected and approved by the countries and approximately 120 re recipes were cooked uh, at the UWI and the weights of the ingredients were collected before cooking and well described uh, as the final weight of the recipe. And the nutrient composition of all recipes were calculated using mixed uh, recipe uh, method. And when it comes to nutrient composition, a team of uh, food uh, composition experts from uh, different parts of, of the world, uh, Australia, Brazil, uh, we are really involved uh, in, uh, in creating the nutrient composition as well as research assistance from both university, universities, University of Paraná in Brazil and uh, the University of uh, uh, the West Indies. And for all food entries, uh, food composition data in uh, food uh, composition table and uh, all uh, had, uh, I mean, uh, missing values were taken into a consideration. And this collection, of course, of food composition data can be the basis for a future uh, development of uh, food composition uh, table uh, for the Caribbean. And what we had the strengths, some of the strengths of the uh, Caribbean version of my food 24, there are, there are many strengths, but it's not, uh, I don't have enough time to talk about all of them. So uh, some of them uh, include frequently consumed foods and recipes from St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and uh, other Caribbean uh, uh, countries. And uh, collaborative efforts, as mentioned, two universities were involved and you have, you have experts from FAO, right? Uh, uh, led by, 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 by Roots and of course, uh, then you have the development of a, the comprehensive food list and, and recipe. So just look at the example, how deep we went in. So if you have yam, we had to mention all the different colors of the yams, as I mentioned earlier, uh, because they have different phytonutrients. And then we had to say whether it was, it, uh, the, the yam was dry or fresh. And then the cooking method, was it fried, was it cooked? And then the type of food, and the type of fat which was uh, really used. So, and, and of course, uh, local uh, recipes that were used. So these are some of the strengths of, uh, of uh, uh, our survey. So uh, challenges, yeah, it was really time consuming uh, to develop the Caribbean version about uh, seven mon months, right? And uh, well, you could see why seven months, a uh, huge number of uh, the items in the food list, a huge number of the uh, quantifications and availability of trained personnel in a food database uh, preparation. So it was kind of a, a, a challenging uh, of, uh, for us, right? So uh, we, I mean, we, we needed some kind of uh, uh, training as uh, nobody has ever done such an extensive or comprehensive food list and recipe. And strong IT support was uh, needed for uh, my food 24. At the beginning, we thought that, I mean, it was uh, an easy software to, to use, but unfortunately we came to realize that no. And lack of information from the Caribbean to prepare food uh, database, uh, databases, uh, the recipes, conversion factors, brand names, and food uh, 
uh, amounts and of course uh, but uh, due to uh, the capacity building right uh, as i said we, we had to be trained uh, now of course we are able to do what we have done and of course uh, covid 19 uh, as uh, was uh, earlier mentioned was one of the uh, drawbacks and uh, support from my food uh, team was at times uh, challenging you had to wait uh, I mean, sometimes uh, 48 hours for, for, for response uh, from them. So uh, in trying to conclude, I'm sure I must have extended uh, my time, uh, exceeded my time. Uh, this survey has uh, clearly demonstrated that it is feasible to use my food 24 for individual food consumption survey in other uh, Caribbean uh, countries. And that although the preparation of the Caribbean version uh, of uh, the, 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 my food 24 was su successful. One should bear in mind that future adaptations requires extra effort, money and human resources, including new foods. For example, we excluded insects, grubs and their products. And if, you, if, if in the future we want to carry out study in Haiti, right? They eat uh, lots of insects and grubs. So you have to bring in this new food and it's going to be also kind of uh, challenging. And the compilation of uh, food composition data uh, could be the basis for future development of the Caribbean food composition uh, table and uh, capacity building, yeah, uh, is quite important. Now we know how to do, how to do it, how to do it. Thanks to, to Ruth and, and her colleagues there. Right, so I mean, uh, it will be easier now uh, to do any individual food survey in other parts of the uh, Caribbean country. And that uh, team, the team, and of course, uh, uh, country. So uh, I would uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for your patience, uh, listening to me as a slow speaker and uh, waiting for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barrow, for this uh, wonderful presentation on, uh, on the preparation of my food 24. Um, I would like to say to the participants, you have two possibilities to, uh, to share your comments or your questions. We have uh, at the bottom, we have two possibilities, either the chat or question and answers, where you are invited to um, post your questions and comments because we will have a session uh, at the end where we will uh, discuss and answer all of your comments and questions. And uh, next, I will do a presentation on um, the photo book that we were um, preparing for the survey in Sun Kitts and Nevis. So, and again, I am uh, presenting it on behalf of many people who have uh, contributed and uh, they are the same as uh, in the other uh, presentations that we have seen so far. So the important steps in a food consumption survey are three uh, building blocks. It's the collecting data on food intakes the appropriate use of uh, relevant food, food composition data for calculating nutrient intakes, and then statistically converting observed to usual intakes for evaluation of nutrient adequacy and relations between foods and nutrients and health outcomes. And in this first building block, we have uh, the methods that you choose, and this was very well described by Sharon, the instrument, the food list, uh, and the quantification method. And the quantification method, it's really one of the um, um, most important um, elements of this collecting data, because uh, with the quantification, people have most of the difficulties, not in identifying the foods, but to quantify it. And uh, therefore, we choose to have the photo book instead of uh, models or printed or digital photos. 
And why did we do that? Because we know that, uh, as I said earlier, the largest source of errors is in the estimation of the food intake from the self-reporting uh, um, from the different participants. So we have to help them as much as we can to identify the portion size uh, that they have uh, chosen. Sometimes they also have a poor willingness or memory to, uh, to estimate the portion sizes or a limited quantitative skills or a, a limited photo literacy to be able to, uh, to relate what they see on the photo on to what they have eaten. And the uh, other building block of error is the interviewers. If the interviewers is uh, using the portion size estimations incorrectly, then we have a problem. And this is why Sharon explained we have had really extensive training. And also uh, for the foods, there are some foods which are easier to quantify and others are more difficult. So the uh, large errors of food uh, are in those where we have a high volume but a low weight, for example, for leaves, or um, the, depending on the shape and of the food. So the best uh, to identify is really the single unit solid food uh, much more than the amorphous food. So why did we choose a photo book instead of photo models? So it's much easier to be carried by the interviewers, but less volume and weight. And uh, there is the possibility to display it in the software that we use. Uh, and in our case, it's uh, MyFood24 uh, and to show it uh, into the computer. And we can have a much wider range of quantification possibilities. In addition, uh, we have the possibility of the household measures where we not only can see I have had one glass, but what is half a glass or, uh, or one fourth of a glass. And it is also much cheaper. So how did we develop this photo book? So uh, we took the photographs um, and always in the same standard way the size and number of the portion sizes were between four and six. Uh, the order of the presentation, it's always increasing. It's always the same angle to take the photographs, always the same background, always the same reference uh, objects for scale. And, um, and between the different portion sizes, there must be a visible difference so that people can easily say, I have had portion two or portion three. And the other thing was as well, is to, uh, to choose the fraction of uh, each portion size. So instead of saying I have had the portion number two uh, of the photo X or Y, uh, I could say I have had three quarters of this photo. And all this, what we have done is based uh, on, uh, the, um, on the guidelines which are published uh, by IAC and, uh, and uh, Dr. Crispin is uh, the first author of that. So how did we do it? First of all, we uh, defined the food list and the recipe list. And of them, we decided for which we will need a photo and for which one we want. So we came up with 225 common foods, including 25 recipes for which we would need to have a photo. And because we choose 121, it is obvious that some of the foods uh, can be um, estimated using the same photos. We got uh, the permission from the Brazilian photo book uh, to uh, take some of their photos um, series as, and uh, we have had the rest be photographed uh, in St. Kitts and Nevis. Most of them and some of the photos did not come out that well, so we needed to reduce them in, uh, in UV. Then we define the uh, food groups into which we will put the photos. And uh, we prepared then the, the photo book, including the editing and the layout. And uh, we printed some 20 books uh, to be used in the survey. So what is the content? First of all, there is uh, the background and then there is the objective. First, our first objective, uh, obviously it was that we uh, use it in the individual food consumption service and send kids and nets. 
Then we included it in the uh, MyFood24 uh, version, and it can then be also used in other Caribbean countries. So when they decide to do a survey. And we thought it's not only useful for the survey, but also for nutrition educators to teach individuals about uh, the portion size and to have a better idea of how much they can eat of what. Then uh, the next uh, part is the description of the development of the photo book, then instruction how to use it in a survey as well as in nutrition education. Then we have the photo index and the photos as well as the weight or volume of each of the photos. And at the very end, we have uh, the plate size in real dimension. So the content. So we have three types of photos. One, the first part is the household measurements with the fractions. There are 37. Then a series of uh, portions, uh, as I said before, between uh, four and six. And then we have uh, food portion standards, which is, for example, different types of uh, apples or coconut dumplings. And uh, on the pages with the household measurements, we also have a real size uh, meter in centimeters. And uh, all the photos are grouped into four, into eight photo in food groups. And here are some examples. So you can see these are the, um, the, the different classes that uh, are frequently used in St. Kitts and Nevis, but also in the Caribbean. So, uh, and you can see that uh, for each of the classes, we have uh, the fractions and you can see how many centimeters they are. And it's the same uh, with, the, um, with the spoons. And here is the meter that I was talking about. And at the annex, you will see that uh, for every glass, uh, what is the volume? And in this case, uh, every household measurement is only in volume. And you can use the uh, um, file inputs density database to convert then the uh, volume to the um, weight of the food. And as you know, uh, the weight uh, of the foods are different. This is why we said uh, we only have the volumes here. So in, here it's the same for all the uh, spoons. We have uh, the volume. And here are some of the portions, um, with the, the, the photos with the portions. And I would like to invite you to have uh, a mental exercise. So uh, in your point of view, if you would like to choose 250 grams. So which is the closest one to 250 gram of the Caribbean fish soup or of the cooked yam? I give you a second to decide. And here is the answer. So um, I think it is not always obvious how much gram it is. And you can see that uh, the portion two or here the portion four has uh, close to 250 grams. So, and I think many people are not really knowledgeable about uh, this quantification, and this shows really the importance of having this photo book. And here are some of the examples of uh, the portion, uh, food portion units. And again, here we have them together with the different weights. So, and when people are asked to choose, they should not choose according to the color, but the size of uh, the apple. And here you can choose of how much margarine or butter, butter is on the bread. And again, you have the weight. There we also have uh, some which are uh, complex. So on one plate, you have uh, different uh, biscuit types. And again, for each of them, we have the weight. The conclusion is that uh, this is an excellent quantification aid uh, for future food consumption surveys. And it showed really very useful here in when we did the survey in St. Kitts and Nevis. It will be a file publication and globally available free of charge, like uh, all the publication of FAO. And uh, it uh, and 
So it can be useful not only uh, in St. Kitts and Nevis, but also uh, in the other Caribbean countries, because we really did it in the thinking that it should include the foods from all the Caribbean countries. So, uh, and the volumes and the weights are very helpful uh, to, uh, to know uh, how to translate the, uh, the photo, the amount on the photo or um, Yeah. And with this one, I would like to close and um, and uh, give the floor to Katrin and to Latoya to explain about the field experience. Thank you, Doctor. Good morning, everyone. My name is Latoya Matthew Duncan, Country Coordinator for the Food Consumption, Individual Food Consumption Survey. And this morning, along with my um, Dr. Catherine Cargill Warner, we'll be presenting on the experiencing and the experiences and lessons from the data collection and design and implementation. Next, please. Outline. Our, our, pre our presentation will focus on the following, recruitment of field staff, field equipment use, sampling steps, data collection, field experiences, lessons learned, conclusion, and implica implications for further studies. Enumerators were selected from various departments within the Ministry of Health, as well as pooled, a pool of experienced interviewers and unemployed citizens with computer literacy in St. Kitts and Nevis. 85% of the enumerators were involved in, involved in previous government surveys. 10% were involved in surveys of similar nature. Um, most recent survey was the Community Health and Nutrition Household Survey conducted in 2012 under the Farm to Park project. The final team comprised of 20 enumerators who took part in a week training held in October 2020. Six field supervisors were selected to assist with the survey, four supervisors from St. Kitts and two from Nevis. These supervisors came with a wealth of experience and knowledge. Three um, came from the ministries in St. Kitts and Nevis, and three came from the statistics department in St. Kitts and Nevis. Prior to the start of data collection, the following survey material were issued to field interviewers. The field supervisor was responsible for ensuring that the field interviewers had ad adequate supplies of the materials needed during the time in the field. And here we have the list, as you can see, of field equipment um, that was distributed to the enumerators to ensure the success of this survey. Um, here we have the multi-stage sampling um, design that was used in step one which is location, as you know, the survey was held in St. Kitts and Nevis. We have in step one, selection of enumeration district as well as random sampling. In this step in St. Kitts, a total of six participants were chosen from each enumeration district and they were selected randomly. This was done similarly in Nevis. However, eight participants were selected from each ED in Nevis. In step two, selection of households, systematic random sampling. In this um, step, the selection of household was the responsibility of the field supervisors using a systematic random sampling. And the final step, which is step three, selection of individuals, as well as the KISH method, um, using the KISH grid, once a household uh, was selected by the field supervisor, the field supervisor created a listing of all the persons in the household that are eligible 
for the interview process. From that listing, the grid is used to identify the individual who would be interviewed. The field, the field supervisor is then responsible for obtaining consent, written consent from that individual who was selected from that particular household. And the field supervisor additionally schedules an appointment for the interview, uh, which will be carried out by the enumerator or interviewer. Data collection, um, the duration of data collection, we started in November and complete November 2020 and completed data collection in January 2021. Data was collected every day of the week. Um, we did a representative sample, both island, they were done um, separately. We also looked at gender and food consumed on the days of the week. A data monitoring farm was used to track all data activities. Um, Dr. Cargill will now continue with the rest of the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Okay, to continue from my colleague, the field experiences will be presented according to technology, my group 24, field staff, and key challenges. So this survey was a novel one for St. Kitts and Nevis because as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, technology played a vital role in data collection during this time. Tablets were used and as a result, it, was, it made data monitoring easier and it allowed for remote access so that errors and outliers could be detected and corrected on a daily basis. It also helped with identifying any additional training needed as the data collection progressed. For example, it was identified that interviewers had some difficulty entering recipes. So additional training was provided. With regards to the Caribbean version of MyFood24, again, this was a new concept for collecting and entering food data, which was complemented by the photo book as it gave the participants an opportunity to visualize their portions or quantities of the foods consumed. However, the one week training provided was found to be insufficient as a survey progressed. And it was noted that our training was required to allow the staff to become more familiar with the photo book, the complex food list that comprised of 16 food groups with one food having several variations, as mentioned in Dr. Fawa's presentation. Then there's also the cultural diversity, whereby the same foods have different names across the regions. For example, a popular one was Pelo in Trinidad, would be called Cook Up in St. Kitts and Nevis, as well as food preparation and cooking methods used. Something to note with MyFood24, being a UK-based company, there were time zone differences which affected diary dates generated initially. And so we had to bring it to their attention so that it could be adjusted. In addition to that, the company upgraded the software during data collection, resulting in format change, which caused glitches. A few staff displayed limited understanding of the foods as they were not familiar with certain food names, cooking methods, etc. So the complex food list, it slowed down um, identification of food items and proved time consuming for them at first. Also, we found that initially there was insufficient prompting of participants to get details. For example, something like um, a participant having a cup of tea you know, for them to ask, did they, did they put sugar in the tea? Did they put cream in the tea? Was it milk? Did they have a full cup of tea or a half cup or a quarter? There were instances of inaccurate selection of food items, cooking methods and portion sizes, for example. So because of this, additional editing and monitoring was required for the 24-hour recalls. I would just like to highlight some key challenges experienced. One challenge was that there was a need to provide field staff with individual coaching and support to help maintain their motivation and to improve data quality. Also, field staff had no access to edit recalls after submission. And so 
they had to keep written notes, you know, if they had anything that they wanted to change or any, any mistakes that they made in order to facilitate data editing. There were also technical challenges in the field due to mobile data coverage on both islands. As a result, some 24 hour recalls were collected on paper and later inputted. And our issue with this is that inputting data collected on previous day, on a previous day would change the item at a date and diary date and in turn affect data analysis. In addition, we experienced an island-wide blackout that stopped data collection over a few days. Another challenge was that over an undersampling of the days of the week and gender had to be very closely monitored. However, despite limitations, accuracy and data quality improved. One last challenge was that the pandemic delayed staff remuneration, which impacted morale. So what are some lessons learned from this survey? So on the technology, firstly, that there was a need for trained staff with a good understanding of tablet use and familiarity in navigating MyFood 24, as well as there should be IT personnel on standby. We also learned that only having or only doing online training is suboptimal due to limited participation and feedback mechanisms, and that adequate logistics are necessary for training sessions. In addition, Ongoing training is necessary to improve and maintain quality of data. Furthermore, adequate training when adequate planning when using technology is vital, as we learned from our experiences that we have to ensure that appropriate time zones are selected before starting and that program upgrades should not be scheduled during collection. And for situations involving unplanned technical issues, for example, an, an island wide A paper-based questionnaire may be useful, but only in half. We learned that appropriate training in the area of food could have enhanced data collection and reduced errors. Also, trained field supervisors could have been provided with access to the data submitted and in turn assist in monitoring and coaching on an individual basis. Additionally, daily monitoring of collected 24-hour recalls by UE and feedback to the field staff improved understanding and quality. We learned that flexibility is needed for unplanned staff dropouts and reorganization of field staff, field work, and the importance to plan for the unexpected in regards to staff remuneration. Also, the role of the country coordinator was key to assure that instructions were understood and followed by field staff. So in conclusion, Due to COVID-19, travel to St. Kitts and Nevis was not possible, which impacted on training and supervision quality. The use of technology to collect food consumption data was useful during this time, as data was easily accessed and monitored. Overall, with appropriate coaching and support, data quality improved. Implications for future studies. Future food consumption surveys in the Caribbean and Latin America may profit from the MyFood24 version produced, the photo book compiled, the training material developed, and experiences and lessons learned from the survey planning and implementation. Overall, using technology is the way forward, giving consideration to cost and human resources. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for this uh, insight in how it really worked on the on the ground and uh, about all the lessons learned, uh, which are many more than uh, than this one. And as Sharon said, you know, it's only the tip of the iceberg. So we are now looking forward to the preliminary results. Sandra, you have the floor. Thank you, Rod. Um... So it's my pleasure to share with you the preliminary results, the methodological issues, some of the methodological issues uh, in analyzing the survey data from St. Kitts and Avis. 
So just a snapshot of what you have heard, uh, we had a three months of data collection. And that's important to say that was done during a pandemic period and that no collection was performed between Christmas and New Year's celebration. Uh, we initially had the aim to collect the data from 960 adults uh, with expected proportions between the two islands and from men and women, uh, and actually we achieved 1,500 adults in the final sample size. And this is because uh, we had the challenge of getting the right proportions for men and women in the two islands. So both uh, this, this number has both information from 24-hour calls and the general questionnaire. From 40% uh, of the sample, we also have a second 24-hour call, which will allow us to adjust for within personal variability, the, take into account the day-to-day -day variation that we know is important in dietary service um, to estimate usual intakes. I also would like to highlight this point that the number of quality controls were performed uh, on a weekly basis as well. So apart from the individual quality controls Kate we mentioned, we had a weekly reports to, to see how the data collection was going on. And uh, that actually uh, made us to drop some individuals even before the survey was finished and replaced them by no, uh, new, um, new subjects. This minimizes certainly the number of implausible values uh, at the end of the survey. So um, in terms of sample characteristics, we have a proportion of 74% of the sample coming from St. Kitts and 26 from Navies, which was expected of uh, age mean of 43 years old, uh, being 59% um, of them being women, 95% African descent, 79.4% uh, were employed and about 62% had a high secondary school completed. The other uh, proportions were divided between low educated individuals and higher uh, educated individuals higher than secondary school. The number of persons in the household on, were on average almost three persons per household. And in terms of household monthly income, we had a distribution among low incomes and higher incomes uh, going down when income was a bit higher. Uh, if you can see in the ranges of $3,000 and $5,000. 32% uh, of the sample size did not wish to provide this information or did not know. When you look in the health and lifestyle habits, you will see that six about 6% of the sample declared to smoke, 38% declared to be supplement users. In terms of physical activity, 47.7% uh, reported having mild physical activity, about 20% moderate, and about 25% vigorous physical activity. And then an important result of our survey so far is the high BMI status. Uh, values uh, that we, we encounter. Uh, if you see here the yellow and the gray uh, parts, we were up, added up to 65% of excess by weight. So considering overweight and obese uh, proportions. And uh, this is what expected, but it, it's a high proportion uh, that we observed. And it's also important to acknowledge that this, this is coming from self-reported data. And as also ex expected, the proportions were a bit higher for women as compared to men. When you look at the food purchasing habits, uh, this is an important aspect that we wish to say more apart from the 24-hour recalls because we are not sure how we would be able to gather, get, uh, collect good quality information about this from 24-hour recalls, considering that people may not know uh, how the food was produced or, or sold to them. Uh, we asked them if they were purchasing local produced food, generally speaking, and 96.5% said that yes. And the types of purchased local produced food were above about 90% for fruits, vegetables, fish.
vegetables provisions uh, in a less proportion, and also meat, poultry, and catching fish. Um, can you hear me well? Because I just got a message here that my internet is unstable. No, it's fine. So um, you were lost a little bit, but we saw what you were talking about. Okay. So this is an information about the local production. Uh, we also ask if you are buying foods from the supermarket just to make sure. And, and that, as expected, 95% said yes, and um, a little proportion no. Now going into the details of the 24 hour recall assessment, I just would like to mention a few aspects of the pre-analysis of the data. Uh, again, after the collection was finished, a number of other quality controls were performed to, was performed to identify extreme values and access the plausibility of the data. Just as an example, uh, here we had excluded seven recalls with no justification because of low reports, and no recalls were, uh, were said, uh, were contabilized to present more than 4,000 kilocalories. Another aspect that I also would like to highlight that we have just finished and will be considering in our future analysis is the recipe disaggregation. Because although my food had the possibility of uh, disaggregate foods or to build the recipes during the data collection, we had a number of standard recipes that needs to be broke down after the collection was finished or, or need to be ready for data analysis. And the procedure was developed for allowing proportion of ingredients including water, which is often underestimated, to be merged with the reported data. And this will allow us to have better assessments of the food group level. And also for the matching, this assessment, uh, this uh, merging of data between consumption and composition that was already mentioned, was performed by food consumption composition specialists following FAO in food standards. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge that, that although the number was very high, about 30,000 food items. Uh, this was done in a very um, with quality controls and uh, in a very good manner. And uh, one step, one something that was done during this merging was to allow for grading the matching quality between consumption and composition, uh, being one exact match to best available in three calculated. And when we look into these numbers coming from 13 food composition tables, um, we see that we observed a 63 exact match between the consumption and composition data, 21% best available and 16 was calculated mostly for recipes. And why I'm saying this is because when we look into um, that the number of foods that were actually reported in the survey, that is of course much less than 30,000, it's 2,161. We see that we found that very good match for 84.3% of the survey, which is higher than the total, total table, uh, total compilation. And about 16% of this matching is considered to be of less quality. It doesn't mean it's That, but it means that we have like certainty about the quality. So talking about the distributions of the day of the week, uh, we are aiming to have a more balanced representation, but it was very challenging to actually get the proportions of men of the islands in all other aspects we needed. And at the end, we have an underrepresentation from Thursday to Saturday, uh, which needs to be taken into account during the data analysis. Um, also important to, to show this result about the Goldberg cutoff analysis at the populational level, uh, since this is more um, applicable or more, um, the word is now, it, it, it's more useful for populational nutritional service. Uh, when we compare the energy intake with the basal, basal metabolic wage that is could, be, could be translated in energy requirements. So we calculated this figure, which we call few, to see the degree of under or overestimation of the data. This lower confidence interval and upper confidence interval give us the idea of what we should expect uh, between this ratio. And in fact, we see a lower few 
uh, leading to the conclusion that underestimation of the reported food consumption exists in this survey at the populational level. This is expected. We were not expecting an exact um, um, uh, that there would be no underestimation because we are talking about 24 hour recalls. But this is low, uh, it's a bit lower. And it's important to consider that a high prevalence of overweight and obesity is present in this population. And we know that they tend to uh, underestimate intakes even more. And another aspect that we also should not rule out is that economic impact because of COVID pandemic situation may have led to lower intakes indeed, apart from uh, their energy requirements. Another methodological choices of this assessment that I would like to highlight with you is that we are doing the adjustments following the NCI method, the adjustments of the within perseverability. Um, and these usual intakes are being adjusted uh, for survey weight, effect of the day of the week, and sequence of 24 hour recalls using different models uh, considering the nature of, uh, of the dietary components. And we will be reporting 25 dietary components, uh, including energy, macronutrients, and also vitamins and minerals. Um, and um, perhaps not everything will be presented today, but that's our, our intention for the whole data analysis. And the last consideration here is that when you look at the food composition data coverage, consider that we will always see some missing values in in these compilations, we found uh, above 98.5% of completeness of the data. Uh, actually, just sugar was 98.5, and the rest was above 99%, which is very good. And the last methodological consideration that I would like to bring is that uh, we wish to compare the information on nutrient values uh, with the recommended dietary allowances for the Caribbean. But it's important to recognize that this, this recommendation is a bit old and is focusing on the RDA, which is more appropriate for the individual level assessment. And because we are looking at the populational level assessment, uh, we'll be considering these other uh, references here. We are still deciding and defining the cho uh, this choice, uh, but so far that's what we have been considering. So uh, now looking to the, some of the results of the current Ferrari calls, uh, you see that about 93% of the sample population reported having breakfast, which is something good. And then we have high proportions for lunch and dinner. 37% are snacking between the meals. And um, this is a meal occasion that my food brings as an option. And 64% were reporting having drinks. When you look at the energy intake uh, on average or look at the median total sample, we see a low intake as we already have uh, expected from the Goldberg values at uh, about 1,400 kilocalories. This is uh, comparable between the islands in terms of median. Uh, and of course, we observe a higher consumption for men as compared to women. And then if we look at the contribution of macronutrients to this energy intake, uh, we will see a high proportion of energy coming from fat, uh, about 30% for both men and women, and also for total sugar, which is about 20%, but it's slightly higher from, for women. Uh, and this is possibly, possibly a target for policies and programs in the area uh, that could be focused. Um, looking into the reduction of these numbers. And if we look at the food consumption occasions to the intake of energy, energy and nutrients, you will see that most of the contribution for energy macronutrients uh, will be coming from breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But we have this important result here that's adding to 20% of energy coming from total sugars which if you're looking to a bit more in, uh, close to which foods are actually contributing to this total sugar intake, you will see that fruits and beverage drinks, and here excluding natural fruits and juices, are contributing to 40%. Added sugar in beverages are contributing to 25%, soft drinks, alcoholic drinks, uh, also to, to a certain degree. 
And uh, we know that high consumption of sugar sweetened beverages are of public health concern. And again, this could be a possibility for policies and programs targeted to the total sugar intake. Um, similar um, contributions will be seen for vitamins and minerals uh, in relation to food occasions, mostly coming from breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but then some variations here considering, let's say, vitamin C, which is also coming from drinks. And the last result I'd like to share with you, and here I'm not presenting figures yet because we still have a long way to validate the numbers with the workshops Sharon has, has mentioned before, but we have vitamin B3 and B12 uh, as being adequate for most of the population. And for a number of vitamins and minerals, we have observed low intakes, uh, at least for part of the population, of, or for subgroups of the population. At, the, at this moment, this is of no concrete, um, there are no concrete indications that these low intakes are of concern from a public health point of view, but we certainly need further evaluations and monitoring, uh, which this data will allow us to do now. And at, Key preliminary finding considerations to finalize my presentation is that expressive self-report of overweight and obesity was observed in the same population. Main meals are the most important source of dietary intake in the population, as expected. A high contribution for fat and total sugar intakes was observed, and this is a possibility for targeted policies and programs. A low consumption, uh, low intake was observed in the pandemic period, and this is an important aspect to be considered. It may partially justify the results, but we still need to, 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 to look into that into more detail. And I guess it's also important to acknowledge that the underestimation of food consumption should not be neglected in the evaluation, especially based on the Goldberg, Goldberg cutoff evaluation points, uh, which has um, showed us that. And I would like to remember and highlight especially that this is a photography of the food consumption. Uh, is the first monitoring of the country and certainly this will allow us to monitor and confirm the present results over the years. Future analysis will uh, be performed to confirm the observed nutrient values and its inadequacies. Uh, so far, we also have not looked into much on the food group assessment but we, we wish to assess the food sources of nutrient intakes and also compare food groups uh, with guideline comparisons, such as the national guideline from the country. Exploration of the data across educational and income levels will be performed. And further insights on the consumption of food according to local production, especially considering that for some food groups, not all, we have the scriptures available to in, uh, to give us some information on locally produced production or homemade production and uh, industrial production. Other data explorations will be disseminated through scientific publications. And to finalize, I would like to acknowledge um, the assistance or some, some help at certain point from intake organization, Mega Digitaler and Joanne Arsenault, uh, Maxime Lucien and Susie Alcame, who are statisticians, and also Deborah Frizzi, who certainly helped me, uh, helped us a lot with the data analysis uh, of the survey. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra, for giving us an insight of the preliminary results of uh, this uh, exciting survey. Um, may I give now the floor to Bridget? And may I remind everybody that uh, you can, uh, if you have any questions or comments, please put them into the chat or the Q&A. Thanks very much, Ruth. Uh, Sandra, would you mind just uh, stopping the sharing of the screen, please? Yeah, I'm trying. Oh, now I found. There we go. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Um, so I'd like to start by thanking Ruth very much for the kind invitation to present today and thank you all for your attendance and especially staying to the end of this webinar. Um, I'd also like to thank the St Kitts and Nevis project team for welcoming me, welcoming me recently to the, the project team. So my name is Bridget Holmes and I'm a nutrition and food systems officer and leader for the nutrition assessment team in FAO HQ in Rome. And I'll be presenting today about our commitment to dietary data sharing and dissemination. I'd like to just start by extending a, a special thank you to the nutrition assessment team, in particular those working on the sharing of dietary data. So Victoria, Agnieszka, Rita and Teresa, um, some of whom are attending the webinar today. And a bit of background before I get into the nitty gritty of the presentation. Um, so a bit of context um, related to dietary data. So when I refer to dietary data, I'm referring to data about what people eat. So food consumption, what nutrients are in food. So food composition and how adequate the diet is. So adequacy, quality and diversity. And we know it's well recognized that there is a lack of dietary data, especially in low and middle income countries. And it's the aim of the nutrition assessment team in FAO to accelerate data sharing, maximize data use and create a robust global evidence base on which to develop policies and improve nutrition. So we've heard already in the different presentations about um, why dietary data is needed and, and the relevance for St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, but just to give you a, a summary of some of the reasons why it might be needed. So first of all, simply to understand about why people, what people eat and drink and understand the context that they eat and drink. So when they eat, where they eat, with whom they eat and meal patterns and habits. But we can also look at differences in dietary intakes by factors like age, sex, um, type of area, income or family size. And provide evidence on energy and nutrient intakes. We're also able to use this type of data to understand nutrients in food and the sources of nutrients in the diet and understand how particularly local foods or wild foods might contribute to adequate diets. We're able to look at um, diet quality and diet diversity and identify areas of concern in the diet or those population groups of concern. We're also able to research healthy and less healthy dietary patterns and investigate the link between diet and health. So for example, looking at non-communicable diseases, which we understand is particularly important in this region. We can also use this data to evaluate and consider the need for food fortification programs, but also to monitor and inform national food policies, guidelines and health education programs and track progress towards the SDGs. And as Sandra was just mentioning, we can, we can also use the data to monitor dietary trends and shifts. For example, looking at trends over time or particular towards particular types of foods. And finally, we can look at things like the sustainability or the implications of food choice and use the data to monitor and inform food safety policies and agricultural policies. So with these reasons in mind, I'd like to share with you some information about the, the Global Individual Food Consumption Data Tool or GIFT. And this is developed by FAO in collaboration with the World Health Organization, together with other international partners, and is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This tool serves as a platform to make global individual quantitative food consumption data publicly available, accessible from all countries around the world, collected through both large nationwide surveys and small scale surveys. So there's different types of data that we can include in this platform, but we focus on data that is collected using 24 hour recalls, which was the method of choice for the St. Kitts and Nevis survey or food records. 
but we, we only in, include dietary data that was quantitative, so where information was collected on, on amounts and covering the whole diet, so where we have information on all foods and beverages consumed. The data that we include must or, already be matched to food composition data and amounts and nutrients reported as consumed. We also ask that the data for recipes is normally disaggregated into single ingredients. And we have um, a limit of at least 100 subjects in a, in a survey. But we do include um, data sets from national, subnational, or small scale data sets, depending on the country. There are several possible outputs that you can obtain from the platform. Um, the, the platform essentially provides food based indicators for nutrition and food safety infographics and visual representations of the data, and these are particularly adapted for non-specialized users. We also um, share metadata summary statistics and microdata is available for download and further analysis with a particular focus on low and middle income countries. So the example screenshots you can see here um, are just illustrating the kinds of outputs you can achieve from the platform. Um, for example, you can look at very high intakes, which are relevant for food safety. Um, you can also understand more simply contribution to the daily diet from different food groups. And another example here, for example, we can use the platform to look at the sources of micronutrients and macronutrients in the diet. And this illustration is just um, to show you how that would look. So to date, we have metadata available on nearly 300 surveys worldwide and microdata available for 24 surveys, as you can see from this map taken from the platform. Um, in order to, be sh to share these types of infographics, there's several steps that need to be followed. And this slide illustrates those steps. So, um, the first step for us is to identify the existing data through our networks and through searches. We then validate the eleg eligibility criteria, for example, the sample size and the method of dietary assessment used. Once data owners agree to share their data, we undertake a comprehensive data harmonization process which involves coding the data using a system called FoodX2 developed by EFSA. This allows the classification and description of foods using a common language across databases worldwide. Sometimes this type of food X2 coding is carried out by the data owner after training by FAO and checking by the team. In other cases, this is carried out uh, by, the, by the team themselves. But for, for both scenarios, there's a lot of interaction between the data owners on this and then at the end of the process, the data can be shared through the platform. So just to highlight where we are now with this uh, development of the platform, we're hoping to expand the work that we've been doing and we aim to disseminate microdata for at least 50 data sets in total by the end of next year. And we're continuously working to expand the metadata inventory of surveys. We're also working to create new infographics on dietary adequacy, diversity, food safety, and environmental impact. And this will further maximize the use of dietary data. We're working on developing methodological protocols to share and improve the platform technology. And additionally, we undertake regular capacity development activities, including extensive training, giving to key stakeholders in countries on the use of their dietary data and training on data harmonization for data managers. And we've trained over 200 data managers to date. So with this uh, data sharing in mind, I want to just uh, share a few considerations with you. Data sharing is not always straightforward and we often face challenges. So for example, the sharing of microdata there's often difficulties accessing the data owners themselves and the willingness of data owners to share their data. The timing of the sharing is often critical versus other survey deliverables. And there's, there's legal issues and privacy, privacy laws that we need to take into account. 
We also need to consider carefully the quality of the data. So understand precisely the method of assessment, the method description, the portion methods, et cetera. And for this, we cannot stress enough the importance of keeping clear protocols to, to document methods used. There are also important considerations in the, in the data use, including com clear communication to platform owners and transparency regarding data limitations. Regarding sharing of metadata, we often lack sufficient details and publications. And of course, we see a time lag between data collection, publication, and then entry onto the inventory map. And with these considerations in mind, it's really key to stress how important partnerships and collaboration with data owners is. So just to summarize, <clears throat> um, we really see that there's huge opportunities in the collection, sharing, and use of data to improve global nutrition. And the first step towards having effective intervention is having reliable data on which to base programs and policies. At the core of this data need is reliable information on what people eat and drink, what nutrients are in food, and how adequate the diet is. Despite this data need, there is a currently a huge knowledge gap. And it's the FAO nutrition assessment team who will be aiming to focus on bridging this knowledge gap and accelerating data sharing and maximizing data use to create a robust global evidence base. So if you know of a survey that is not included in our map or you have dietary data to share, please do get in touch. With this in mind, I'd really like to share some good news with you that the survey that you've been hearing about today, the St. Kitts and Nevis National Individual Food Consumption Survey will be shared soon on the platform. And this is with kind agreement from the Ministry of Health. And I'm really delighted that this data will form part of the, the platform. And I, I thank the ministry and the project team. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. And back over to you, Ruth. Thank you so much. So uh, I think uh, we have now seen the uh, the data flow from the very beginning to where it could end up. So in the uh, FAO WHO gift platform. So thank you so much. And uh, I would really like to thank uh, each of the presenters for uh, to be in time, very interesting and, um, and, and really, I hope motivating for others uh, to, uh, to do the same. So we are now in the section of uh, question and answers and um, we have uh, some questions. So one of the first one is, uh, will the presentations be available? This uh, webinar is recorded. So, and it will be published on the FAO website. So where you can find it. We will not share the presentations as such but only the, um, the, the recording of this webinar. And um, then we have a lot of questions on, uh, on regarding of my food 24. So um, as an NGO, would I have access to my food 24? And if so, how much would it cost? Who would like to uh, answer? Probably Sharon. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Um, we paid over 13,000 pounds, UK pounds, to be able to use the platform. Um, but we were putting in data for two countries, OK? And so it will be, um, you will have to interrupt with MyFood24 to get a precise code for your use. So I can just share our experience. Thank you. So it was very expensive. I want to add this, not a small amount of money. And then there's the annual license to be able to continue to access the data. Um, but you do have the ability to download all your data at the end and use it as you see fit in country. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. So uh, we have a question from Uruguay. Um, would you uh, do you think that we could use the Caribbean MyFood 24 version in Europe? 
well, I, I think Ruth, you are in the best position to answer this question, but I, I, would, I would say yes, uh, that um, uh, it, could, it could be possible uh, to use it in, uh, in that country, uh, but they need to um, add the specific uh, local foods uh, that, that would not be present in the current uh, Caribbean food and drink uh, database. So uh, Ruth, maybe you can add more to that. <laughs> sure, so Sandra, you, uh, you are uh, raising your hand. <laughs> yeah, I would just like to say that uh, an important aspect we consider is the language that can be adapted within MyFood24, but as Uruguay speaks Spanish, uh, the whole database behind, I believe, in terms of uh, food description needs to be adapted, uh, translated, and also adapted to the local food pattern. That will uh, mean extra work, but it could be a beginning, uh, a start point for, for, your, for building your database. Yeah. So, and probably to add something on it. So um, other uh, MyFood24, so they have between probably um, 2,000, 3,000 uh, food entries, we have 30,000. So it means that we are much more detailed and it is very likely that uh, uh, if you want to uh, adjust our version to yours so that uh, you will find uh, the foods already entered into the system. So which will be a big advantage. But uh, as, uh, as Sandra said, it's, uh, if Uruguay is in Spanish, you need to, uh, to translate everything into Spanish and probably also use different uh, photos and uh, photo box uh, for the uh, local foods that you have. So add some and uh, dismiss others. Um, where is the Caribbean My Food hosted? Is it hosted in UV or in the UK? It's hosted in the UK, um, coming out of my food 24. They, they maintain the, the platform that all the information is uh, resides on. What we're in a position to do is download the data. Once it's collected in the field, it's immediately translated online. And so that we could get that immediate recovery of data. So it's hosted in the UK, but accessible to the uh, data owners and in our case as the service providers and so on who engage in micro 24 it's available to us but we do not host it at UA. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah so um, how many people worked on the preparation of my food 24? Well, I think um, the responsible officer, Dr. Hutchison, is in the best position. Uh, all I can say is uh, most likely um, taking into consideration the senior technical experts, the junior technical expert, uh, people from FAO, uh, and uh, our consultant. Uh, uh, research assistants from uh, Brazil as well as, well as uh, at UWI. I would say about uh, 20, but uh, for precision, I would like to ask Dr. Hutchison uh, to entertain that question. Okay, so I put an answer in the, in the Q&A area, uh, just for the development of the information that went into Michael 24 to allow us to have the survey implemented. We utilized six experts, four support persons, including IT, and approximately 10 research assistants to help with the data entry. However, the additional components of the work that is needed for analysis, uh, such as the compilation of nutrients for the Caribbean, that took three experts and four research assistants. Data analysis required additional experts such as the statistician, the data experts, et cetera. So that I, I, it, depended on, it depends on which aspect of the work you are talking about. As I mentioned, um, there are many different activities were taking place simultaneously and we brought an additional expertise 
to work with us as we went along. I would say that for the for the just for getting this survey implemented, those twenty percent, but for the entire work, um, it would be at least uh, nine experts and uh, twenty seven people on the ground in in Saint Kitts and Nevis, plus more than fifteen research assistants engaged in various activities at different times. Just to give you an idea of the scope of the team that was needed to execute this work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, can I say one thing? Uh, there, is, um, there is Janet. Janet has written something. Can you see it, Ruth? Yes, yes. Let me. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. yeah. So um, to answer also the question to uh, from Uruguay, so uh, Janet uh, Kate, who is uh, the well, I don't know, the, the mother of uh, My Food 24 um, she said that uh, they are developing a new tool for in Peru in Spanish. So uh, this could be helpful as well. Um, for the other, um, the other question is, did you ask if the COVID impacted on food intake? Was there a specific question in the questionnaire about that? Sandra, this might be best for you. Uh, I know that Sharon has already answered something in, in the chat or in the Q&A uh, answer box. Uh, from the data analysis point of view, from what we could see in the data, well, first of all, we did not have any question related to that. So if we could have asked something specific, but we missed that opportunity. But I'd like to say that spontaneously, we had a few feedbacks from the participants saying that pandemic was affecting their lives. There was no high number, but uh, it caught our, our attention during data analysis. And that's why we are making these uh, considerations. I made these considerations in the presentation because it was spontaneously said if we have asked, perhaps we would have more feedback on this type of information. But also as Sharon has pointed out, uh, uh, the island has not been affected a lot by the lockdown, it seems, uh, although tourism, yes. Um, I guess we need more time to talk to the country to validate all this information, to be able to, to, to say what's the implication of this, uh, the results we are presenting. It's something to be considered, but it's hard to affirm without having been asked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, then there is uh, another question on the trace values in the food composition table, how that one was translated into values. And um, I may uh, try to answer this question. Uh, in the in foods file guidelines, we say that uh, trace elements should be um, recorded as a value, half of the LOQ. So, uh, and uh, as the uh, standards of uh, file inputs were followed, I guess this is uh, what uh, was taking place. Um, then we have uh, some other questions about. Uh, countries who would like to use it, uh, to use 24, uh, my food 24, or to, to ask uh, FAO for, for assistant to do the same like uh, what was done in St. Kitts and Nevis in other countries. So this is uh, not to us to, um, to comment on because uh, this will depend on the country where you are in and um, if there is uh, somebody like Latoya in San Kitts and Nevis who has all the energy and is able to convince uh, the uh, FAO representative to say, you know, uh, yes, this is something that we need in our country. So uh, FAO is a very good um, uh, agency to help us in doing so. Uh, why don't we collaborate and do it? So uh, this is really uh, depending on the country, depending on uh, on the urgency that every country sees uh, if they want uh, or not um, uh, do uh, a food consumption service and then with whom. Um, then um, 
Then I have uh, a lot of comments uh, from our participants saying, uh, really very nice presentation, great, uh, thank you so much. And um, so just to add, the Peruvian MyFood24 version will feature an offline function too, which might be useful. If you would like more information, contact uh, the MyFood24 team. So uh, please uh, look at the internet, uh, MyFood24, and contact them. Um, with this one, if we don't have uh, many more, if we don't have ad any additional questions, uh, which I don't see for the moment, ah, there is one, uh, I'm leading a national dietary intake survey to take place in July, November in South Africa. We are concerned about the impact of COVID on dietary intake as unemployment increases. And we had several hard lockdowns and there will be, and there is another way. So, uh, yeah. So if, yeah, COVID is always uh, the last year, I think uh, COVID has uh, have had implications a lot uh, for, uh, for the whole world and even for the dietary assessment. So it's for sure it will impact, but we will only know in the future how it's impacted and uh, to which extent. Mm -hmm. may, I comp may I just say a sure. Sure, sure. word to, to this uh, um, question from South Africa? Uh, I would say I would suggest that the food security uh, assessment uh, should could be performed along with the national survey. This is something we do in Brazil with a scale uh, that is easy to to answer with a few questions that will not add a lot of burden in, in the assessment. We have not considered that for some kids because we did not expect at that point that food security would be a, a problem uh, at that level. But thinking now about the pandemic and that some countries are doing that, I would highly suggest to include this kind of assessment, which is about 14 extra questions uh, in the real result in the degree of food security in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a very good uh, uh, suggestion. And, um, and FAO is also working with Anna Herzfeld to, uh, on the dietary um, diversity questions. Uh, which are about uh, 25 uh, questions and which take more or less five minutes to, uh, to answer. So probably this would be also an additional tool uh, to allow additional and different uh, analysis of, uh, of the food intake of the people. So um, before closing, I would like to give the floor to everybody to give a final um, comment. May I uh, start with, uh, with Sharon? So uh, what would you like to say as to close, before closing? Thank you, Ruth. Um, I would just like to say that it really takes um, very close relationships, a lot of relationship building um, between the country, uh, the service provider and the funder to ensure that the goals are met in a timely way notwithstanding any challenges. And I am very pleased that we had an excellent team of persons working uh, with us. And uh, I was happy that we were able to keep focused and keep moving forward every step of the way. So that team building and team management is a critical part of this kind of process. Thank you. Dr. Bauer. Yes. Um... I would just uh, mention that uh, the, the Caribbean ver version of the My Food 24 we developed, um, it's uh, accessible and, uh, and can be applied, uh, as we mentioned earlier, not only in other parts of the uh, Caribbean, but also in, uh, in, in Latin, Latin, Latin America. And uh, of course, uh, as uh, Francine has uh, written here, uh, there is some cost to bear 
and you just have to contact my food uh, 24 and ask <laughs> about the cost. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra. Oh, no, sorry. Latoya and Katrine. Let's go. Uh... Hi, good, good day again, everyone. Uh, my final comments would be as relates to the experience of this survey overall. Firstly, I would like to thank FAO and their team, Dr. Shandaria especially, um, for their early work and dedication, as well as being one of um, the driving forces to ensure that this survey um, was a success. To the participants, I must say, just looking from the preliminary data, <coughs> I think it's an obvious. We can agree um, that the data, uh, majority of it is a representation of what is currently happening in St. Kitts and Nevis on the ground. And I think it would be highly beneficial if um, we could get some other countries um, to be able to have data like this to look at the current situation on the ground as it relates to nutrition. Um, being in the field of nutrition quite often, we are on the look sometime by some of our peers. So I'm extremely grateful that we now have this data and that we were able to complete a survey like this here in St. Kitts and Nevis, which looks at a lot of the indicators as it relates to the nutritional situation of the population here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, I wanna thank the team again for um, involving me as well as um, follow up to what Dr. Hutchinson said about the dynamics of the group members as relates to being um, actively a part of um, the managing process of this survey. Thank you. Catherine? Well, um, to add to what Latoya said, I would just say that for me, the experience was wonderful working with St. Kitts and the team there, you know, collecting data. It might have seemed, you know, challenging, but it was so rewarding to get good data at the end. Great. Isabella, would you like to say something? Okay, so good morning to the panelists as well as to the participants. Working on the individual food consumption survey has been a wonderful experience as well as a learning one. And the point at which we are at, at this in the survey, I mean, it's when you look back, you wonder whether or not you were really involved in the amount of work that was done to get us where we are at. You know, how um, important, the collaborations with each and everyone, the camaraderie with everyone as well. Yes, there were moments, however, you know, you, you bypass those moments and we know that there was this goal that we had to achieve and we got it done. So today's webinar, to me has really put things in the context and it has brought us to that. It's not the climax as yet because we are still working on other things, but I think it was just a wonderful experience and sitting and listening even made it a lot better. So thank you to Ruth and the team. Thank you, Isabella. Bridget. Yeah, thanks Ruth. Maybe just the last word to say you know, collecting any dietary data is challenging at the best of times, but really having learned about what the project team have done um, is, you know, I really want to just extend my congratulations to all the challenges that they've managed to overcome. And yeah, I look forward to further analysis of this data and, and really getting the most out of it as, as possible. So many thanks. Thank you. So, um, and um, I would like uh, to join everybody else in saying, you know, it was a wonderful experience. It was really hard at times. And, uh, and sometimes uh, I think everybody of us was thinking, will we really manage to do it uh, in the short time available? And, uh, 
And to do everything that we did in uh, one month, one year and uh, three months, it's amazing. It's amazing. And, and it really shows that uh, how everybody, really everybody, everybody on the ground, uh, in the team, uh, in the wider team, uh, has uh, put all their efforts and heart into it and, and making it real. And today, you know, I think it's really rewarding to see how uh, the preliminary data uh, come through and uh, that we can present it and we can be all proud of it. Um, and I hope that this seminar was uh, able to, um, to motivate other countries to, uh, to go the same course. It is, uh, it is painful at times, but it is so rewarding and we really need this data. Uh, so that uh, future policies and, uh, and uh, programs are not just based on an, an estimation of something, but on real data. I see uh, Sandra would like to add something. Yeah, because, because I, I think I, I didn't have the opportunity to say a few last words after uh, Latoya and Catering. <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> I just want to add because actually, uh, Everything that has been said, uh, I, I agree and uh, I confirm. Uh, what I just would like to highlight is that how proud we should be or how proud the country should be with the first national food consumption survey from St. Kitts and Avis. Uh, in Brazil, we are always remembering the first survey. We are always referring to that as the landmark for, for what's going on in the country. If it, things increase it or, or get, got worse, and now as in kids and ages, we will have that opportunity to monitor what's going on with their population in terms of dietary intake. Thank you. Sorry, Sandra, I, 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 yes, I just missed it. Thank you for reminding. And um, yes, and uh, I hope that uh, when you have data or you think to do data, uh, to collect the data and that you will also share it with uh, the GIF platform because uh, um, any data that is just in a drawer uh, or in a report and not being used uh, elsehow, it's, um, it's, it's a nice academic exercise, but uh, it could be so much more useful and data sharing today is, uh, is key, is key to bring the uh, research um, questions up to uh, and to answer some of them. So um, having said so, I would really like to thank uh, everybody uh, of the presenters for their really wonderful presentations and insights and, uh, and to the participants for their questions and participation and patience to stay uh, so long with us. Um, and hopefully we will have more dietary data in the future and not only dietary data but uh, the corresponding food composition data as well okay thank you so much and uh, have uh, a wonderful day and uh, see you soon